Welcome friends, I'm Allison Miller, filling in for the wonderful Terry Styles this week, and here with my co-host Jim Hughes. And I'm with Allison, another great week here. Thank you. In today's headlines, Oakland County approves half a million for Oxford ex investigation, the second season for two sports fundraisers, and road safety updates from Chief Sowald. So sit back and stay tuned because you're watching Oxford News This Week. In another update to the story involving the Detroit News investigation into the Oxford tragedy, the Oakland County Board of Commissioners has approved $500,000 for an independent review of the emergency response to the attack. The board unanimously approved the funds and a resolution calling for an after-action review of the tragedy. The review will be performed by a third-party company hired by the county through a request for proposal process. The resolution was co-authored by Board Chair David T. Woodward and Minority Caucus Chair Michael Spiz of Oxford. According to the resolution, the review will assess the effectiveness of emergency management, law enforcement, fire, and medical actions and identify lessons learned for future preparedness. The review will also provide an unbiased analysis of the response and recovery efforts, including coordination among emergency response services and other stakeholders. The independent firm will be asked to collect data interview key participants, analyze the response and recovery efforts, and produce a detailed report that will be used to improve public safety and emergency response strategies. The one-time funding will come from the county's fund balance and go to the Emergency Management and Homeland Security Department for the contract with an experienced independent firm. An Oakland County spokesman said the county would issue a request for proposal by the middle of this month. Jim? Thanks, Allison. The Oakland County Sheriff's Office Crash Reconstruction Unit assisted deputies from the Oxford Township substation after a moped collided with a pickup truck uh, towing a horse trailer in Oxford Township last Monday. The two-vehicle crash occurred in the intersection of Lakeville Road and Chin Chincapin Road. I think that's what it's called. Uh, just east of Lakeville. It's actually east of Lakeville Elementary and the Oxford Middle School. The timing of the collision uh, intersected with the end of the school day, uh, again forcing parents and guardians to seek alternate routes and delaying buses for uh, around 20 minutes. 29-year-old resident of Washington Township was operating a 2020 Ford 250 pickup while towing a horse trailer with six horses west on Lakeville Road at roughly 2 in the afternoon, 2.50 in the afternoon. She was uh, struck by a 2024 moped operated by the 25-year-old Oxford resident, the moped operator, was traveling north on Chin Appen Rill uh, when he uh, failed to stop at the stop sign for Lakeville Road and then struck the side of the Ford F-250. The moped operator was wearing a helmet, was transported to the McLaren Oakland Pontiac by Oxford Fire Department. He was listed in stable condition at the time. Sheriff's Office is releasing information to the public. Uh, the driver of the Ford, as well as the six horses, were uninjured during the crash. Authorities uh, have determined alcohol is not a factor in the crash, which still remains under investigation. Allison? In additional traffic news, I spoke with Oxford Village Police Chief Mike Sold earlier this month to discuss the recent trends he's been seeing in road safety. This intersection in the village stood out. This light at Washington and Burdick, it seems like somebody runs that light every cycle and it angers me and what I mean by that I'm not saying that people are going through it and it's turning red on them no I'm saying the lights turning red you can count to five and somebody's going through that red light and we can't write enough tickets for that intersection so we are going to be focusing on that because our biggest thing is I don't want I'm trying to prevent accidents mm -hmm. um, and intersections are a big place for accidents to happen because of all the transitions um, the unfortunate thing for, because you always hear about Drainer and 24 in the township, mm -hmm. what's worse about that intersection down there is you have all these transitions coming in out of either, you know, businesses, the restaurants, the gas stations, so you've got constant in and out and turning and going straight, and when you have all this movement, the likelihood of an accident happening is, is going to be higher. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so we're fortunate we don't have all those transitions at our specific intersection here, but you're still having north, south, east and west and left turns and right turns. So um, whenever you have all that movement, there's always a chance for uh, impact. So we wanna make sure that people are complying with that and stopping. So my best advice is when you're coming to a light, whether it's Oxford or anywhere else, start to slow down. Chief Sold says the department aims to quote, up our game at the red light at Washington and Burdick in the coming months. He suggests that drivers should not slam on the brakes at a red light or speed up to make it through to avoid accidents, especially in a downtown area with high pedestrian traffic. Instead, he says drivers should slow down gradually when they are approaching an intersection. Jim? The Oxford Suzuki Strings program is now open for the first uh, through the fifth graders interested in learning what it takes to play a violin. The program aims to build a strong technical foundation for years of musical study and ultimately involvement in the Oxford Orchestra program. Suzuki Strings runs in three sessions from late September to early June, culminating in the Suzuki Concert with the Suzuki Concert on June 3rd. Classes take place two days a week from 8 to 8 to 8.30 a.m. at Lakeville Elementary School before school and students will be bused to their home elementary schools before the school day actually begins. Student schedules are based on their experience and grade level. Tuition for the sessions uh, does not include instrument. Rental Suzuki violin instructors will, saw, will size students on the first day of class and will provide rental options. Parents are also encouraged to observe the Suzuki, cla Suzuki classes to watch their child pro pro child's progress to register, families must complete the registration form online. The form can be found on the, at the Oxford Community Schools Facebook page. Those with questions or even concerns can contact Lisa Clark Suzuki at Suzuki Violin, uh, the instructor there, and the number there, 810-417-0556. Uh, I'll read that again, 810-417-0556. Allison? The third annual Health and Wellness Fair Open House is bringing resources and education to the Oxford Township Parks and Recreation Senior Center this Thursday. The fair runs from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. and includes free blood pressure checks, medication reviews, immunizations, fall risk screenings, and community resources. The first 25 people to check in will be entered into a drawing to win a downtown Oxford gift card valued at $50. The winner will be announced at 12.45 p.m. During the event, visitors can learn about program offerings, community resources, and more to maintain health. Then, from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m., the Michigan Secretary of State Mobile Office will be making a visit to the Senior Center as well. The Mobile Office will help provide service to seniors in Oxford and neighboring communities to aid those with limited access to the internet and transportation. Secretary of State offerings include applying for a first-time Michigan ID, renewing driver's licenses or IDs, applying for or renewing disability placards, transferring titles, and more. Registration is required for an appointment with the mobile office and can be made by contacting Oxford Township Parks and Recreation Supervisor Don Medici at 248-628-1720. Jim? And thank you, Allison. Oakland County Sheriff Mike Bouchard is calling on Congress to pass legislation to allow police the enforcement of drone laws. After an incident involving a drone at the Comerica Park, Earlier in the month with the rock band Green Day was rushed off stage in that event uh, in the middle of their concert at Comerica Park after the individual outside of the event flew a drone into the stadium. According to the Detroit Police Sergeant Darren Zahl, the man was questioned but not arrested and the department forwarded the case to the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration following the incident and Oakland County Sheriff's Office press release stated that the local law enforcement does not have the authority to disrupt drones. Uh, claiming that the only federal government currently possessing any powers, Bouchard said, it, for the Green Day delay was just another incident uh, that actually brought an issue uh, to the forefront. Bouchard also said that thankfully the drone flying appears not to have been done with malicious intent, but warned about the possibility of weaponized drones and the inability for police organizations to actually take any action. At the most recent Dream Cruise, the Sheriff's Office noted there were 85 illegal drone flights over the event, including seven that created public safety issues. 
The statement said that this is under, uh, exist, under existing laws, violators are subject to a fine and there are no criminal penalties for using the drones and those drone violations. Allison? An Oakland County judge has been removed from her docket for unprofessional conduct after a high-ranking court official recorded her making racist and homophobic statements. The probate judge is Kathleen Ryan, who has been on the bench since 2010. Oakland County Probate Court Administrator Edward Hutton alleges Judge Ryan has been calling him both during work and after hours for years, and he said that during those hours and hours of calls, Judge Ryan said highly inappropriate things, including the discriminatory language and comments about her sexual encounters. Hutton said he began recording her calls after feeling like the harassment was not going to change. Judge Ryan was removed in late August for unspecified conduct before media reports of the recordings were published, beginning with Hutton coming forward with an investigative interview with WXYZ Detroit. In the interview, Hutton says Judge Ryan made his life a living hell in the past six years, and that he chose to send out the recordings to ensure people that come to the court have an unbiased trier of fact. In the recordings, Ryan refers to herself as a new racist and uses homophobic slurs against Oakland County Executive Dave Coulter. Hutton submitted a notice of sexual harassment involving Ryan in May to Oakland County Probate Court Chief Judge Linda Hallmark. After hearing nothing back, Hutton distributed the recordings to several county officials. Hallmark, who had not heard the recordings before then, relieved Ryan of her duties and sent information to the Michigan Judicial Ten Tenure Commission, the state agency that recommends discipline for judges. Jim? In our Behind the Lens segment this week, as it should so be dedicated, the week of sports, spirit in the wildcat country. Photos come from the Oxford, uh, a local Oxford photographer, a 14-year-old at that. This local photographer creating a special shot of baseball, tennis, volleyball, swimming, and now even football. At the first varsity match at the home against the defending D4 state champs, uh, Harper Woods, these photos show energy, excitement, and a student section of players alike. And the best part might be uh, the Wildcats went home with a 38-0 victory. Good stuff there in our Behind the Lens segment. Not bad at all, if you're a Wildcat fan, right? True, yeah. You were at that game, right? I was. I actually did a new job. I was doing camera, actually. Oh, really? How did that go? I, I could probably use some work. <laughs> okay, that's all I'm <laughs> That's inside. okay. I, I can only get better, okay? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Improvement mindset, right? Exactly. When you put somebody in a new, uh, a new genre, that's probably a better way to go. I, I had fun. It was a good night, energy packed. Good. And weather helped you, not that, you know, sometimes it can be really fall like at those football games, those oh, later yeah. ones. Yeah. You're all bundled up trying to mm -hmm. enjoy it, right? Yeah, I know. I've worked as a camera operator in uh, Lake Orion's football games. And oh, that's a big stadium, too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And make sure that you bring gloves if you're ever out there in the cold because your hands are exposed. Now, did they put you outside, too? Uh, you're out there with it? Because we had um, uh, a young lady that worked here, Mar uh, Marissa, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. And... Dan would put her on top of the roof and she would yep. come down so cold yep. all the time. It's the same thing over yeah. at Lake Orion. And you go on top of the, the press box uh, to get the shots. You're and, high up there and yeah. it's cold. Yep. Yeah. Freezing, but it's well, worth it. Well, and usually I announce. I was announcers back then. It was just mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, you're sitting in there and we're warm and they come down here and you're like, nah, don't complain about being cold, you know? <laughs> right, yeah. Anyways, you're getting excited. Now, next week, I think you're going to be with Terry because with the story you had just a bit earlier, mm -hmm. I'm going to take my parents to that thing. The, uh, oh. for, for the, uh, the uh, It's in the community event center, I guess. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, my mom wrote about that in the paper, also saw it on TV here, mm -hmm. and said that they're going to go get their Secretary of State stuff done, and then I guess oh, there's good. some other things going on over there. Right, too. yeah, the wellness stuff. So, so I'm the driver, so I'll be the driver. <laughs> I won't be in the news chair next week. So Got it. All right, well, good luck. You're going to have Terry here. The boss will be here, yeah. and she'll probably be sitting where you're at, and you're going to be sitting over here. So. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Good stuff. Yeah. Anyways, uh, coming up on Oxford News this week, in our last story, uh, Allison will have that, and Dave Kenny will have Auto Talk and Science in the News. You're watching Oxford News this week. Welcome to this edition of Auto Talk. I'm Dave Kenny, and these stories are taken from Automotive News. In our first story, Stellantis is investing more than $406 million into three Michigan plants to build electrified Ram pickups and Jeep Wagoneers SUVs. The automaker said it will spend 
$235.5 million updating the Sterling Heights assembly plant to build the fully electric Ram 1500 REV and range extended electric Ram charger on the same assembly line as the gasoline powered Ram 1500 pickup. To do this, the company said it partnered with equipment suppliers and contractors to carefully plan and execute the installation of a new conveyor system, new automation for BEV-specific processes, and the retooling and rearrangement of workstations in general assembly. Stellantis said the Sterling Heights facility will be its first U.S. plant to make electric vehicles. Production of the Ram REV is scheduled to begin before the end of this year. About $97 million uh, will go to the Warren truck assembly plant so it can build an electrified version of the Jeep Wagoneer. Jeep CEO Antonio Filosa has said the SUV will get a range extended electric powertrain similar to the Ram Charger in 2025. And still at Stellantis, a recall. Stellantis is recalling more than 1.2 million pickups because of an anti-lock braking system software malfunction that can disable the electronic stability control system, potentially causing a vehicle crash without prior warning. The recall affects 2019 to 24 Ram 1500 pickups and 100% of those vehicles are expected to have the defect according to documents filed with NHTSA. Defective vehicles were produced from October 31, 2017 and received the February 14, 2024 ABS module software update. The vehicles are being recalled because they fail to meet the requirements of number 126 of the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards. The standard concerns electronic stability control systems and aims to reduce deaths and injuries from crashes caused by loss of vehicle control. According to a spokesman for the automaker, should the system fail, the foundation brake function would be unaffected and the ABS, ESC, adaptive cruise control, and forward collision warning indicator lights will be illuminated at the vehicle startup, indicating the systems are not available. Stellantis first became aware of the issue on February 15th of 2024 when a routine review of customer feedback led to a customer investigation, a spokesman said. Data and field records were analyzed before issuing the voluntary safety recall at the end of August. The automaker is unaware of any injuries or accidents related to the software defect. The remedy, which consists of a software update, will be provided free of charge. Dealer notification is expected to begin on September 12th and owner notification at the start of October. Well, that's it for this edition of Auto Talk. I'm Dave Kenny. Stay tuned to Oxford Community Television. Back with you in Oxford Sports, uh, fundraisers galore. The Oxford Cross Country Program is continuing the tradition of giving back to the community. Uh, this week before the rivalry football game uh, uh, between Lake Orion and Oxford on Friday, the Oxford co Cross Country team from both schools will run from Dragon Country to Wildcat Stadium in an effort to raise money for the 42 Strong. Again, that's up and coming, uh, the foundation. Uh, 42 Strong started in the memory of the late Tate Mirror who played football for Oxford High School and he actually wore the number 42. It is a peer-to-peer -peer mentorship program that seeks to create better futures for by helping students develop greater senses of purpose, community, and resilience. Last year was the first year of the event when a pair of teams raised well over $5,000. The runners relayed the, the, to the game uh, from Oxford High School to Lake Orion and the drivers honked uh, their horns and cheered out the windows as the vehicles uh, passed by the teams as they ran. Uh, this year, the teams will also be competing to see who can raise the most money to donate to the program. The link to make the donation is already online. Uh, you can visit that online source. Visit Oxford Athletics Facebook page to learn more how you can contribute to either the Oxford or the Lake Orion team. Either way, you're a winner. Those who are interested in cheering on the runners in real time can expect them to leave Lake Orion High School at 4 in the afternoon uh, the day of that contest. 
The Addison Township Firefighters Association is hosting a Chuck Johnson Skedaddle 5K and 10K fundraiser once again. This will be the second year of the annual event that held in the memory of Sergeant Chuck Johnson. Johnson was a dedicated member of the Addison Township Fire Department uh, uh, from 2004 up until his passing in 2021. And in that period, he helped train, mentor, majority of the new hires that are actually there that came through the department doors. He lost a battle with COVID pneumonia after fighting it for well over a month in the hospital. So to give back to the community in his memory, the Firefighters Association is hosting the annual race. Runners will take on the Pollyann Trail and proceeds from the event will go towards the Great Lakes Burn Camp and the Chuck Johnson Scholarship at the Oxford High School. To honor Johnson's humorous spirit, a costume contest will once again take place during the event with the prize of the best, the top male and female placing runners will also receive rewards. Participants can enjoy light refreshments and early registers will receive an event. A t-shirt registration is open until Sunday, the day of the race. 10K runners and walkers start at 9 a.m. 5K runners and walkers will start shortly after. For more information, including on how you can even volunteer to help out the event for, uh, or become a sponsor to the event, contact this number 248-628-5600. Once again, sounds like a great cause. Sporting underway, great to have you with us with uh, Oxford News this week. Dave Kenny's got one more segment, our own Allison Miller. She'll have her last story today. You're watching Oxford News this week. Welcome to Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenny, and this story is taken from New Scientist. DNA analysis of ancient remains from Easter Island shows that the population was in fact increasing when Europeans arrived rather than collapsing as reported by some historical accounts. The results also show that there were interactions between the residents of the island and those of South America long before the arrival of the Europeans. Both the island and its people are also known as Rapa Nui. Located in the Pacific Ocean, 3,500 kilometers from South America, Rapa Nui is one of the most remote inhabited islands on Earth. Polynesian people began settling there around AD 1200 when its 164 kilometers were covered in palm forests. By the time the Europeans arrived in 1772, the vegetation had largely been destroyed by a combination of rats and overharvesting. The history of the island has often been portrayed as an example of unsustainable ecological exploitation and population growth followed by collapse. In the latest study, J. Victor Moreno Mayar at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark and his colleagues looked at 15 sets of human remains kept at the National Museum of Natural History in Paris, France, collected by expeditions in 1877 and 1935. The researchers worked closely with representatives of the Rapa Nui community. One of their aims was to confirm that the individuals at the museum were in fact from the island, as there is an effort being led by modern residents to repatriate the remains. The results show that the 15 people who all died in the past 500 years did originate on Rapa Nui. A population undergoing a bottleneck from a collapse in numbers will have signals in their DNA showing a drop in genetic diversity, says Moreno Mayer. We are using statistical methods that can reconstruct the genetic diversity of the Rapa Nui population throughout the last few thousand years, he says. And interestingly enough, we do not find any evidence of a dramatic population decline around 1600s as expected from the collapse theory. Instead, the results suggest that the Rapa Nui population increased steadily until the 1860s when slave traders kidnapped hundreds of islanders and a smallpox outbreak killed many more. The study also identified stretches of DNA in the ancient Rapa Nui genomes that have an indigenous American origin. Their analysis suggests that the mixing of these populations occurred around the 1300s. Our interpretation is that the ancestors of the Rapa Nui first peopled the island and shortly after made a return journey to the Americas, says Moreno Mayer. Previous studies have also cast doubt on the story of a population collapse. Carl Lippo at 
Binghamton University in New York said it was terrific to learn that a completely independent line of evidence points to the same conclusions his team reached in a paper published earlier this year using radiocarbon and archaeological evidence. He says the study confirms that the island was populated with people who lived resiliently and successfully until the arrival of the Europeans. Well, that's it for this edition of Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenny. In our last story this week, seniors go behind the scenes. Through the power of Oxford Township Parks and Recreation's active aging programs, approximately 70 local seniors had the chance to tour the Edward C. Levy Company mining operation on Ray Road. The adventurers geared up with hard hats, safety glasses, gloves, high visibility vests, and personal flotation devices. Then they boarded a floating clamshell dredge named Centennial in honor of the Levy Company's 100th anniversary in 2018. From high above the water, the seniors watched the clamshell extract around 25 tons of material each time it was raised. The seniors were treated to the knowledge of Levy director Ruben Max Bauer as he served as the tour guide. Levy extracts over 1 million tons of aggregate annually from the Ray Road site, shipping its products all year long and employing 19 people. More than 400 students have visited the Levy site this year as a part of school field trips, but this was the first group visit for seniors this year. Recreation Supervisor Don Medici is planning another senior visit for next spring, so stay tuned for more information. I always love the last story. Good, yeah. I'm glad. <laughs> it's awesome, it's always that little boast of energy. Yeah, right? for sure. So you're getting excited. I know we talked about it last week, and uh, you have one more week doing the news, right? Yes, yeah, so I'll yeah, be You'll here. be with Terry mm -hmm. and uh, getting ready. Now, I, I had this mental picture. I got Now, when you go to college, yeah, I'm sure you, 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 when you get on a train or something, or do you drive? Oh. <laughs> Oh, we drive because we have to carry like all of the things that I need. Okay, okay, right? okay. That's yeah. what I was wondering. Okay, I, I, I saw. Here's the mental picture I had. Okay. You had this big old this big old crate thing, and you were mm -hmm. pulling it on wheels, and you were getting on the train. Oh, like Harry Potter, <laughs> like that. Maybe that's how have it you, was. Have you seen any of them? The... I saw a few of them. Okay. I know they have to go through some kind of a wall to get yeah. to Potterville or something, or what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is it called? So the um, they have to get to the Hogwarts campus. Hogwarts. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I know. My son, the younger son, who's now 31, who's not so young, he was a big Harry Potter person. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what was sitting on the shelf one day. And come to find out, it was something to do with the sport. Oh, yeah. I think yeah. it was a Quidditch or something. Yep. Is that what they call it? I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it was a Quidditch ball. And I didn't know what that was. I was like, what's that? He goes, that's Quidditch. And I said, oh, well, I'm sorry. I didn't know. <laughs> right. But, yeah, I mean, that was all. That was, and then uh, I do know one thing about Harry Potter, though. Okay. About, okay an actress that is in Harry Potter. Mm hmm but she was also in Downton, uh, Downton Abbey. Oh, yeah. The lady, Maggie Smith. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she played, uh, yeah, she was like the, the patriarch in Downton Abbey, and then yeah. she was also an actress, at, I don't know what she did in Harry Potter. Yeah, but. yeah, kind of a similar role, I guess. She played a professor who kind of looks out for um, Harry and his friends, so. And I think what happened there was, is like I was watching Harry Potter, and mm -hmm. I, it was probably when Blake was really young. Yeah. And I'm like, hey, I think she's in Downton Abbey, and he's like, I don't know what that means, but. Yeah. <laughs> Well, at least you're able to I make try, the connection. Okay? Yeah. I do try. Okay? Right. I try to bridge the gap between mm -hmm. old and young. Okay? Yeah, that's good. That's what we're doing here. We're bridging the gap? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't know what you're doing at home, but if you're bridging the gap with somebody, you know, just have fun with it, right? Uh, we always are happy to have Allison here. OCTV actually can be viewed here on Spectrum Charter, Channel 191, uh, Channel 99, and the ATT Uberts system. And let's say you're on ATT Uberts, and you're like, I'm done with it. Go to YouTube. You can catch us on Facebook, Rumble, the Amazon Fire Stick, and of course, the Roku app, which I watch there. If you have a show idea and would like to possibly even volunteer to uh, find out more about television, go to OCTV, give our office a call at 248-628-9658. Uh, ask for Dave or even Terry. Very special thank you going out to producer extraordinaire himself, the man behind the, behind the lens, uh, director Kyle Snage, news writer Allison Miller, also your editor from what I understand, station manager Terry Stiles, who will be in this very chair next week. For everyone here at OCTV, I'm Jim Hughes. Hope you can have a safe week. I invite you back next time when again we will take a look at Oxford News this week. Have a great week. <laughs>